Welcome to everybody tonight. Uh, my name is Kristen Fletcher. I'm the Programs and Outreach Manager at the Haley Public Library. And it's my real pleasure to have um, Kathleen and Brian Bean and Pedro Loyola uh, join us tonight um, in a talk that we're calling Sheep Herding in the 21st Century. So I'll introduce them more in a moment. Um, but I wanted to share with you uh, our mission, which is to encourage lifelong learning discovery and enrichment. And it's always my, uh, my hope and my goal and my, my vision that um, when you attend one of these talks uh, in these times that we're in, in these little postcards, I see each of you in little postcards arriving from someplace, um, that you'll go away feeling like your lives have been enriched, you've learned a little bit, and, and uh, maybe learn a little bit more about our community and our heritage. So. Um, I always like to feature a book uh, that we have here at the library. Tonight I'm going to feature um, two items. One is a DVD called Sweetgrass. Uh, it's a documentary about uh, sheep herding in Montana. And I asked Brian about it before we started. And he said, oh, it was very, very good. So um, I feel uh, comfortable recommending that. And then another book that we have uh, called Beautiful Sheep. And it's literally a portrait of different sheep breeds with a little bit of um, description about them, uh, some 40 different breeds of sheep. Um, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about uh, those woolly ones, um, one of the things I learned from that book, we, we did a little practice run yesterday and Pedro mentioned that something about Suffolk sheep. So I looked up Suffolk sheep and that became uh, recognized as its own breed in 1810. So, um, it, so it has those little uh, uh, vignettes of, of historical interest. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's happening here at the library. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday, six, uh, 10 to 6, for limited browsing. Our computers are available. We are unfortunately not able to accept book donations because our, the books that we get through donation get funneled into our spring and our fall uh, book sale, and those have been canceled for this year. So um, uh, please hang on to them, and hopefully we'll be able to accept your donations uh, next spring. A couple of upcoming talks you might be interested in. On Thursday, October 15th, Julie Weston and her husband, photographer uh, Gary Morrison, are going to be speaking about their new coffee table book called Magical Universe of the Ancients, a Desert Journal. Um, this is a compilation of images and writings of their many journeys down to the desert southwest. And then on Thursday, October 29th, uh, Lee Pollock, who is the former executive director of the Winston Churchill, International Winston Churchill Society, is going to be talking about the fascinating and interconnected lives of Winston Churchill and Averill Harriman, uh, two of the most prominent figures in the 20th century. Let me admit someone here. So for tonight, I would suggest, uh, some of you may be very um, familiar with Zoom and others of you not so familiar, but in, if you take your cursor into the upper right-hand corner, and I'm on a, a, a a, um, um, a PC computer, um, you'll have an option to choose either speaker view or gallery view. I would suggest that you click speaker view. That way, whenever um, the person who's speaking is speaking, that will be the featured image on your screen. And then another option you may uh, want to take part in, in the lower uh, left-hand corner of your screen, uh, again, I have a PC. Apples are a little bit different, and I'm sorry I can't help you there. You'll see the option uh, for mute and to stop video. Um, so we are recording this, um, so it'll be, I'll send an email out later um, after the talk with a, a link to this talk. It'll also be posted up on our website. Um, some people don't mind at all if their image is um, recorded. Some people don't really like that. Um, it's awfully nice for the presenters to see familiar faces and actually be able to talk to people um, instead of black boxes, the names on it, but that's your personal preference. 
So if um, you take your cursor into the bottom middle of your um, Zoom screen, you'll see a chat option. And if you click on that, a window will pop up. And at the bottom of that window, uh, you can type uh, your questions in. And what we're going to be doing tonight, uh, we're going to um, see a short video. And then the evening is broken up into um, four different themes. Um, the first one is a uh, quick look at the history of the ranch, um, the yearly sheep herding cycle, sustainability and conservation, and um, their famous grass-fed lambs. Um, so at the end of each one of those segments, we'll take questions, or hopefully you'll be typing those in the chat box and hitting enter. Um, I'll be monitoring those questions. And at the end of each of those sections, then I'll present your questions to Brian and Kathleen and Pedro. And then at the very end, if time allows, um, we'll take some general questions that might have just popped into your mind uh, and you didn't get it into the chat box in time. So I uh, hope that makes uh, some sense. So, um, I'd like to start now uh, by introducing Brian and Kathleen Bean. Uh, they bought the Lava Lake Main Ranch in 1999 and began raising sheep in 2000, uh, learning everything they know from their ranching neighbors and their able, experienced sheep herders. They have made it their mission to weave conservation science and ecosystem protection into livestock management and that has been the guiding principle of the ranch since they've owned it. Pedro Loyola was born and raised in the Andes Mountains of Peru in the village of Honduras at almost 14,000 feet. He came to the United States in 1988 and began herding sheep, working first for Pete and Frida Santa Rosa before joining Lava Lake Ranch in the year 2000. As Lava Lake Ranch's foreman, Pedro oversees every aspect of the ranch, from livestock management and farming to implementing conservation principles and projects. He and his wife, Marina, are US citizens. And I'll just pause for a moment right now um, and just say that this, uh, this talk was intended to be a part of Trailing of the Sheep. And when Trailing of the Sheep was canceled this year, we had a conversation about whether we would go forward with this. And so this is sort of our way of, of um, celebrating uh, another year of trailing of the sheep, but coming at it from just a little different perspective. So uh, I'd like to um, welcome Kathleen and Brian and Pedro this evening. And um, so should we show that video now? Um, uh, it really gives a, a splendid visual overview of their ranch. This is a video that my daughter, our daughter Phoebe, created this summer for us. And um, so uh, it just will give you a good sense of the scope of the different kinds of landscapes and what we do. Now we're going to see. <gasps> there it is. It looks like it might work. There we go.
love the way the, the horse looks at the drone at the end of that shot. <laughs> Well, that's just such a wonderful video, and um, it's the second time I've seen it, and every time I see it, the idea that pops into my mind is I am so grateful that you folks own this land and work with your partners, many partners, um, and, and take such excellent care of it. Um, so, um, so thank you. That is really, I'm sure everybody's thinking that same, same thing. Um, so, Brian, tell us a little bit about um, the history of the ranch, um, uh, maybe even the, the older history of that area. Sure. So <clears throat> not everyone appreciates that Idaho is actually in the Pacific Northwest, and it was not part of the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and as a consequence, it was up for grabs and there were different, you know, sovereign states that wanted a piece of what is now Idaho. Um, and so there was a federal policy uh, encouraging westward expansion and that manifested in the Oregon Trail and the California Trail, both of which are represented in Idaho, by the way, or go through Idaho. And, um, and then the Homestead Act of 1862 and eight or nine successor acts took all this land that the U.S. Uh, 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 had claimed and allowed uh, individuals to homestead uh, where uh, the deed, if you lived on it for five years, put up your 10 by 12 foot homestead check and survived, that deed of ownership would pass from the public domain to private hands. And so that's why Idaho has so much public land uh, and why these uh, larger sheep ranches uh, consist of some deeded, deeded land, certainly, uh, but state leases and federal leases, both BLM and National Forest. So in the old days, um, uh, you know, folks were headed to California, uh, really starting in the late 1830s, certainly by 1843, and then gold was discovered in 1848, and in 1849, we had the 49ers and the gold rush, and those folks going to California broke off from the Oregon Trail in Casia County, Idaho, and went up the Raft River, and then off over the uh, Goose Creek Divide into Utah, Nevada, and onto California. Uh, and there's a wonderful uh, bronze uh, set of statues there at the split between the Oregon Trail and the California Trail with uh, the figures waving to each other, a perpetual wave, because they would probably never see each other again. Some going to the Willamette Valley and others headed to Sacramento. Uh, so anyway, uh, there's more in the way of this transcontinental trail network in Idaho than any other state. So in addition to the main Oregon Trail and the California Trail, you have the Kelton Road, you have sublets cut off, you have um, uh, the uh, 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 Good Ales cut off, and the Good Ales cut off actually goes right through our ranch gate. So our best uh, estimate looking at the, the histories and whatnot is that 30,000 people uh, made that westward migration on the Oregon Trail to, to Oregon, in this, in this particular case, to Willamette Valley um, from 1862 to, well, the last wagon, covered wagon, the historical record went through uh, Boise in 1890. So that giant sweep of westward, westward expansion and trail history and Idaho uh, plays a huge role in that. And we're delighted that we have about 12 miles of the Oregon Trail on the ranch. Uh, and, and we just leave it alone. Uh, mm -hmm. And we let the uh, Oregon California Trail Association folks come up every now and then. And uh, well, when, whenever they ask and they put in their Carsonite signs, you know, good ales cut off and, and it's all good. So. Uh, of course, um, uh, the history of our landscape didn't begin with uh, Anglo-colonialists heading west. It began uh, at least 11,000 years ago, um, and uh, uh, different uh, uh, tribal ethnicities, you know, the northern Paiute, the Shoshone, or Shoshone, 
Um, and then uh, uh, others uh, mixing at our northern boundary with the sheep eater Indians and whatnot. Um, so here for many, many thousands of years, um, you know, Folsom culture, Clovis culture. Uh, and then really, uh, Alexander Ross uh, came through this uh, area in the mid 1820s, went up the Wood River Valley and then bushwhacked over Galena Summit, you know, rode through the Sawtooth Valley, went to the Stanley Basin, and then somehow managed to get down the main stem of the Salmon River to Chalice in October of that year with about 100 people. And that was the first kind of white uh, 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 incursion into where we at least live, and I'm sure there are folks that are from different places listening to this. So. Uh, that was either 1824 or 1826. Uh, and of course, they were trapping and it was the Hudson's Bay Company. So in any event, uh, lots of history. Uh, the ranch, uh, and we preserved Good Ale's Cutoff in pretty much the condition it probably had uh, when the last wagons rolled through about 130 years ago. Except that when we first bought the ranch, we went on one of those roads and I said, could we, could we do anything to improve this road? And I was like, it's the Oregon Trail. No. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yes, um, pretty rough. It's still pretty rough. Um, so I uh, want to just remind um, uh, folks who are participating, if you have any questions, please find that chat box, which um, you put the cursor in the bottom of the Zoom screen and click on it. Uh, and type a question into the bottom. And when we get to the end of this part of the history of the ranch, um, we'll ask these folks some questions, so. Well, fast forwarding to our, um, our the advent of the Bean family to Lava Lake, we were looking for a little getaway somewhere in the West. And uh, Brian saw the flyer for Lava Lake Main Ranch and got very intrigued by the idea of being a ranch owner and raising livestock. Um, we both have a little bit of farming and ranching in our background, family backgrounds, but, not, um, but nothing like this. Uh, and I think it's location, you know, we're boarded on the, um, on the east and on the south by Craters of the Moon National Monument. So uh, obviously it's a pretty amazing spot. And, the, the way the lava comes up and forms Lava Lake and then gives way to um, ranch land is really very cool. So Brian got excited about the idea of being in a Homestead Act state where you buy a ranch, but you also, with that come the, the privilege of leasing public land around that ranch and began to develop a vision for being engaged in conservation in a big way. Um, doing a lot more than you could do on land that you just owned yourself. And so uh, we bought Lava Lake Main Ranch in 1999 and then added um, several um, sheep outfits in the next couple, over the next couple of years and created this footprint of public and private land uh, and began raising sheep about which we knew exactly nothing, <laughs> like literally nothing. We were living and working in San Francisco um, and we remained in San Francisco as our primary residence for 15 years, um, partly because Brian was still working and we had kids in school and we said, well, this is just the way we'll do this for now. Um, but uh, we're privileged to raise our girls spending all of their summers um, at the ranch. And our home at the ranch consists of a yurt and several sheep camps and a bathhouse. And uh, so they were able to have the kind of you know, growing up experience that I think, well, not very many city kids get to have, that's for sure. And um, spent their time playing on the ranch and hanging out with our Peruvian sheep herders, which was the greatest thing ever and moving sheep. So uh, we learned everything we needed to know, as Kristen said, from the folks who's, especially from the folks whose outfits we bought, you know, their kids didn't want to carry on or, or were no longer um, with them. And um, Brian's uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the landscape that he gained just by looking at the topographic maps in our dining room in San Francisco for countless, countless hours really endeared him to them. And so 
um, even though we were from California and we were environmentalists, we were highly suspect in all kinds of ways. But uh, folks really uh, took us into their hearts and um, and helped us learn what we needed to know. And and we just and of course we just relied on our sheepers who knew everything they needed to know. And <laughs> we would just say, okay, whatever you say. Uh, so. Uh, that's kind of the story of how we got into it, and um, where it's been uh, the defining, uh, probably one of the most important defining facts in our family life. Uh, both our girls are avid outdoors women. They're fine horse women. Um, they fish. Uh, Phoebe hunts. Um, they're backpackers. They're keen observers of nature, and um, I'm really grateful for that, that they had that upbringing. Pedro, maybe we can hear from you for a minute. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Pedro A. Loyola. I born in the center of Andes in Honduras, Peru, on a small town or a small 40 acres lot with a few sheep, a few cattle, and, and a couple horses. At 13, 1,500 feet above sea level on March 30, 1966. My dad was a miner and my mother was a countrywoman. Both are deceased now. I never went before to a, a big city until I did finish my high school at 18 years old. Like my older brothers, I joined for the university, studied anthropology for a while. Then a work offer came to me in the United States. I never think two times and decided to travel as a shipper with Western Ranch Association on November 4th, 1998. I will never forget that day. I did start working as a shipper in Cary, Idaho for Biscay Land and Livestock for nine years, then become a ship foreman for three years until Biscay Land sold this company to Lava Lake Land and Livestock on May, on May 20, 2000. Since then, I'm still working as a ship foreman for Lava Lake. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Um, yes. So you came from a very small village in the high Andes. What was it like to go from that to a whole new country, language, culture, and really, a, I mean, you, your ambition was to be an anthropologist, and here you found yourself herding sheep, um, a lot of sheep, right? Yes. <laughs> well, I. I have a cousin and a family here before me. They came in 1970. And uh, well, I heard a lot of good things from the United States, you know. And uh, in Peru on, in the 1980s, there were a lot of things going on over there. It was not easy. And then my cousin came to Peru and said, well, I have a job for you. And I said, what kind of job? He said, be a shipper. <laughs> then I, I, I never think twice. I used to say, yeah, I, I go for, for that. And then in, he told me like in, a, in July, three months later, I was here. And I, I, I did enjoy, I like this country. I like people. Uh, I like it. Uh, it's my home right now here. This country is my home. So it sounds like your family's um, place in Peru, there were just a few sheep. How many sheep did you start herding when you first got here in 19, uh, what was it, 1999, was it? When I came here, we in Peru. Yeah, when did you come here from Peru? Yes. Yeah, my first experience with being a sheep was very tough and, and lonesome. Uh -huh. At the start, not now in the new, the new country. Never in my life I was in charge of 900 ewes and 1,200 lambs. That was a normally band 
in this area. On a big open country with no fences or pens or corrals. But over the, the months past, I, I learned that being a herder was not tough at all. I enjoy my life in the open country, looking the mountains, the snow, and the, and, the, and the fresh water come out of the snow, the mountains, was not tough at all. I enjoy life in the open country, looking the mountains. After, uh, I say, looking the herders, the old, hel old Basque or Peruvian names carried on the aspen trees. After a few days, I decided to carve my own name on a young aspen tree, thinking that my name will be there for a long time when I, a next generation will came to this country. They can see that I know I was here, and they can say, I know this gentleman from my town, or, or he is my family. After I finished my three-year contract, I went home on vacation for 45 days, and then came back on a second contract for three years and six months. After three contracts, I started working on my green card. In 1998, two years later, I got talking about uh, the laws, immigration laws. In those years, they, 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 were, they were not too tough. Mm -hmm. I've been here three months, uh, three years, and went home for 45 days. A lot of people went for just a month. Now it's different. The contract is just for three years. If you go home, you gotta be home for, for at least three months and then start your paperwork again. Mm. In 2004, I, I, I got married with Marine. She's a Peruvian too. A year later, in 2005, I become a ship, uh, an, a US citizen, Marina. My wife is a citizen too. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So could you just, so, oh, let me stop here. So, um, so I think this is, we've talked about the history of the ranch um, a little bit uh, and no one's typed in any questions for this sort of section of our presentation this evening, which is fine. We can catch up with some later, but if you do have any while I'm talking right now, um, put them in that chat box. Um, and uh, the next thing I was just curious about, you know, you talked about um, working nine months as a sheep herder. Uh, um, what's the yearly cycle? You're the foreman of the ranch now. What What is your, um, what are your responsibilities? What's your yearly cycle? And and how many people do you um, do you manage or oversee? Well, Lava Lake Land and Livestock in 2001 brought three more ship companies. From went from 5,000 to 9,000. We did uh, a lot of change, on the, like on the ship raising, like take care of our private land and public land too. Our our staff member and the shipper are are very clear that the ship will graze this can, this can, the country once over for a period season. Our decision was reducing our ship numbers to protect the land. As a ship foreman, I'm in charge for the ship and the ranch operation. My 32 years of experience counts in my decision every day. Talking about uh, 15 years or 16 years, we have uh, like 18 sheep sheep herders. 18 sheep herders. Okay. Two okay. two, two contenders. And uh, on the operation, on the offices, on the office, Lavalix office was like two people. Mm -hmm. uh, over the years, we reduced our numbers 
to five bands. Then we have like six shippers. And right now we have two bands and we have uh, four shippers and a camp tender. Uh, I mean, every year is not the same, but we can have more sheep or less sheep, uh, but uh, more people or, or less people. Mm -hmm. So does one sheep herder oversee a band of sheep or two sheep herders? No, most the one sheep herder oversee a, one band. One band, and how big is a, a band? Uh, it's uh, go to 800 use to 900 use. And okay. Sometimes with like 1,200 plums or 1,250. Aha, uh -huh. wow. Great, and, and so what is the year? Excuse me, I never heard your question. We can't hear you, Kristen. Hmm. You can't hear me at all? No, you're there. Okay. You lost your friend. My internet connection is unstable. Oh, dear. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, could you describe a little bit, um, Pedro, your yearly schedule, um, starting maybe with um, a yes. slamming part? Uh, I'll start uh, on, on like in, in September. Yeah, on, uh, my daddies are in the f year cycle. First, we have a, an early meeting with, in advance with Lava Lake staff to discuss our plan for the season. Have a plan ready. Then we, we, we start some meeting with government agencies for them to, to approve it. On, on August or September, after we ship the lambs from the mountains, it's time to cool our ship. We look very carefully for each ship, look in the body condition age, illness, or sickness. At this point, we form a new band of 900 sheep for the next 12 months. The next day after the lambs were shipped, we start the breeding season with like 20 head of sophic rams or sometimes some rambolite rams until October 31st. On October 20. We take all our livestock out of the range to the private alfalfa farm in, in the Bellevue Triangle. Gannet, Piquibu, even carry. On December 15, finally we, we reach home for winter at Lava Lake Ranch. At this time, the sheep is in dry alfalfa and grass mix for the next three months and 15 days. Winter is a alarming season for us. At Lava Lake Ranch, we have capacity for two bands. And we have uh, a big clammy shed, pens. This is a time that the days are short and the nights are long. We take care of our livestock for 24 hours a day. Some herders take care of the new born lambs. Other herders feed the entire livestock flock, like sheep and horses, and plowing the snow when necessary. At tonight, a herder is in charge to take care of the, the lambs for several days. On April 1st, our sheep bun start to travel to the desert on different BLM allotments, like Star Lake, Wild Horse, Lilo Park, for a couple months. Our sheep and lambs graze on, on wild and unfenced range, moving freely and, and selecting. Something happened? Okay. You're okay. I think okay. you're okay. And selecting forage for themselves. At this point, it's time to shear our sheep, not the lambs. After May 20, we start 
moving the sheep to the mountains on private land, beer land, and the forest allotments. Until the lambs go to the market at, at Lava Lake, we share our ranch with a large diversity of wildlife. Our grassing protocol improves the condition on the, on the ranch and we like. Thank you. Well, that's fascinating. You said that at one point that the, um, you sheared the ewes, but not the lambs. Is that correct? Yes. Why, why don't you share, share the uh, lambs? Because at that point they are like, they're young, pretty young, like three or four months. And uh, normally we share after they were a yearling, like 12 months or 13 months old, start oh. sharing. It just helps protect them, it sounds like. Uh, no, really. Oh? <laughs> no. It just, and there wouldn't be enough wool to worry about yeah. off yeah. the yeah. animals. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. Huh. So, um, so Pedro, do you have any stories to share? Do you have, was anything exciting happened when you're up on those mountains? Yeah, one history story. It's about uh, when I was shepherding at the mountains, the camp that moved the sheep camp close to the big pine tree. And uh, like 10 or 11 o'clock, I, after I take, take care of the sheep, I went to my sheep camp. My horse was walking I mean, smelling and walking different. She was kind of spooked, but I never know nothing about uh, strange around my camp. Then uh, pretty soon I tied my horse on a different place. Uh, the dogs never hear anything or smell anything. Then I went and fixed my lunch. Pretty soon I heard like uh, somebody's throwing a rock or, or something on, the, on my ship camp. I went down and looked around, nobody was there. After a few minutes, same same thing happened. And I told somebody, or another shipper came to my, to visit me and he was uh, trying to, to make me <laughs> mad or something, you know? And then I went out and looked around and around and finally I, I, I look up, the top of the tree was a young bear hanging out, you know, he was, there for a long time. <laughs> uh, uh, the evening came and my dogs watched the bear and start barking. And that bear was there for, I say, from like 24 hours or 18 hours. I went to my sheep camp and I'm to take my care of my sheep in the morning. When I came back, that bear was gone. <laughs> that was the young bear. Ha, ha. Do you see um, cougars up in the mountains often? No, very often, but I, I, I saw a couple times. A couple times? Um, do they yeah, have the sheep? Yeah, sometimes, but it's not very often. It's sometimes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I'm curious, when you're up in the mountains, do you move the sheep every day, or, or how does that work? Yeah, we, we uh, do. We never. Uh, Actually, we never move the sheep. The, the sheep move themselves. <laughs> we, we used uh, and you we just used, keep up, huh? <laughs> yeah, take it to the different place, and the sheep decide to go at, at a new place every day. They they know, don't want to come back and, and graze the same place they grazed before. Okay, so um, we may be talking about this later, but so you start in a certain area near the ranch. Yeah. And then yeah. do you have like a, a sort of a route that you take every year or different yeah. routes depending on the year? Yeah, it's different routes, but uh, it, we start first on the desert. On the I'm sorry. First we start first on, on the desert. Oh, the desert, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It grazed for a while there, like two months, and then start going to the mountains. And, and like in June or July, we we graze on the high mountains and coming back to the shepherd corrals, most, mostly on, on BLM or 
summer and pray to land can come down and, and can the shipping day and we haul the lambs with the big trucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's see. Um, we did have a couple of questions during that period, but I managed to ask them as you were talking. Um, do we have any uh, other questions for Pedro right now? He'll be back, but uh, <laughs> anything about um, the yearly cycle or the, uh, the daily cycle? Um, let's see, we do have a question um, about dealing with wolf predation. And Brian, were you going to talk about that a little bit later in the conservation section, or is this a good time to, to touch on it? Well, I suppose it could be a, a good time, uh, Kristen. So uh, before I do that, I just want to mention that the, the, the annual cycle that Pedro so ably describes um, is following green up, meaning staying on that plane of nutrition to deliver a fantastic lamb, market lamb, um, <clears throat> off grass, meaning off the mountain, no feedlots. And our elevation gradient down to the Star Lake and Sid Butte allotments starts at about 3,800 feet on the Snake River Plain, seven or eight miles north of the Snake River. And the high mountains that Pedro is describing, uh, one of our allotments technically, you know, although it's rock and ice at the very tippy top, peaks out at 11,887 feet. So it gives you some perspective that at least from 4,000 feet to over 10,000 feet or 6,000 feet of elevational change, you're staying and following that seasonal green up and you know, can, you know, the, the lambs just thrive. Um, and uh, that's why this part of Idaho uh, produces such great lambs. Um, <clears throat> One other thing that we uh, uh, have to deal with, or uh, uh, just part of our own management practices in that higher country, we move out of coyote territory, and the coyote is the uh, single most important predator by a, a very large margin on our lambs. And then typically, if there's depredation loss, it's on lambs, but they'll occasionally kill a you. Um, but then we wind up in wolf country, which is typically the intermediate country north of the highway, <clears throat> maybe 5,000 or so feet in elevation and then on up into the high mountains. Um, we did lose a couple of lambs uh, last year to uh, uh, a mountain lion. That happens you know, every other year or so. We have, <clears throat> uh, qu have had this year quite a bit of interaction with bears. Um, uh, and, um, you know, uh, taking one or two lambs or ewes. And we typically uh, have quite a bit of interaction with wolves since the first wolves depredated on our sheep in October of 2002. So this is 18 years now that we've had experience with wolves. Um, and at first, well, firstly, it was a huge surprise because the first wolves that killed our sheep killed our sheep on the main ranch, which is right there by Craters of the Moon. And we knew that they would get here eventually. Um, these wolves are Canadian gray wolves and they were brought down in 1995 and 1996 as a part of this uh, reintroduction uh, in Yellowstone and in the central Idaho wilderness the Selway Bitterroot and the Frank Church. Um, but they arrived uh, sooner than we had expected and we had no idea what to do. So we had some interesting early experiences. One evening we lost 25 ewes and lambs, um, two rams or bucks, and we had one guard dog killed and another maimed that we had to destroy. And that uh, caught our attention. And another night, um, about four hours of interaction with a pack of wolves in the North Fork of the Big Lost, uh, we lost 35 or 36 ewes and lambs. So we reached out and said, well, you know, um, <laughs> we'd had uh, a few uh, uh, animals that we had selected as target conservation species. And, 
the gray wolf and its reintroduction was one of these. And then it was, it was the time for truth. And so we said, you know, we've got to learn how to deal with this without uh, pursuing lethal control. And so we worked with Defenders of Wildlife um, and we began to find on lethal deterrence. Um, and then we began to uh, revise those or progress or evolve those. And I've been doing that ever since um, uh, for the subsequent 16 or 17 years. So um, we will have some wolf depredation probably every two or three years. It's typically five animals that uh, are killed, but we haven't had anything like the uh, depredation loss that we'd experienced early on. We became a founding uh, producer or range operator member of the Wood River Wolf Project, um, which had been created by uh, Defenders of Wildlife um, and just a parenthetical is, if you fast forward to 2014, um, uh, fiscal agency for the Wood River Wolf Project was transferred from Defenders to the Lava Lake Institute. Um, and so we've been doing that for six years. That was in November of 2014. Um, and the project, I think, is in its 13th field season at this point and has uh, a, a pretty sterling track record of preventing serious depredation loss uh, using non-lethal deterrence and uh, human presence, guard dogs, et cetera. So uh, we experience, um, I'll just quantify what I'd mentioned earlier, five to 10 times more livestock loss from coyotes than we do from wolves. And coyotes represent perhaps 70% or 80% of our depredation loss, and depredation loss is probably 75 or 80% of our total disappearance from turnout to, uh, to shipping. So the Wood River Wolf Project has been um, an important part of our <clears throat> operating commitment, and we still use non-lethal controls. We've never requested lethal control um, for wolves uh, uh, at any point, including those early years. And we are you know, committed to uh, maintain that, that record. And I'm sure there, there, there've gotta be some questions about uh, wolves and sheep ranching, but we'll let the, uh, the chat um, uh, serve those up. Um, we do, uh, to go back to um, Pedro a little bit, um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. We'll wait for some of those questions to come in, Brian. Um, but there was a question, Pedro, that came in um, uh, when we were talking about um, the daily life of a sheep herder. Um, somebody uh, put in the chat, how many miles does a sheep herder travel in a day? And I have a question. Uh, in, where is the, because you're way up in the middle of nowhere. So where is that sheep camp that is kind of your home base and that has your supplies? On the desert, uh, we actually we never trail. Uh, just uh, like Brian described, just go pretty easy and graze. And, um, the sheep camp or the, it's been uh, moved every, on the desert every three days, every four days. Oh, oh, talking about 1980s, uh, 90s, there were more sheep. We used to move more, more often. Now we have few sheep or few outfits are on the desert now. We can stay there for for long time, not long time in one place, but we, we, we can go easy, easy. Uh, and we trail the sheep to cross the, the highway or move to another allotment. It's supposed to be like three miles or five, five miles on a day. Three to five miles a day, approximately. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah. yes. So are, are you, I, I actually don't remember if you're going to talk a little bit about um, the dogs, the kind of dogs that you use, um, or if uh, Brian and Kathleen are going to talk about that a little bit later. 
Pedro, you can say a word about the dogs if you like. Yeah, that would be great. So we saw the um, uh, like not really border collie um, that that one gentleman was petting in the video, and then um, the big white dogs, which I'm personally scared of when I go hiking. So maybe you can touch on that a little bit. <laughs> Our I'm big white dogs are pussy cats. With my dog, I am. <laughs> well, I'll jump in for a minute on dogs. The the white guard dogs are um, Great Pyrenees um, or Akbash, which you know all, all those countries have their own version of a big white dog. Um, so they're slightly different, or they're a mix. And we have some uh, who are um, is it Kegel? Kangle. Kangles. Um, but I mean, they are amazing dogs. We, we do try to um, make sure that they will um, bond with sheep enough that they won't you know, leave the sheep to be with people. We've had a couple who we were way too friendly with who we had to, they got washed out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> washed failed, out of the program. They failed the program. <laughs> <laughs> they found very happy homes elsewhere. But uh, having said that, our, you know, I, our sheep herders like their dogs and they take good care of them. And so, you know, the dogs might come running up and bark at you. And then if you just say, you know, no, they say, oh, okay. And then you can, you know, I, I find most of our dogs are pretty friendly. However, when they're up in the mountains, they're wearing nail studded collars. So when they come up to rub up against yeah, you. <laughs> not a good, not a good outcome. You get poked by nails. Um, and then the, the, the other dogs mostly are border collies. That one that was featured is a different uh, mix of a, of a dog. It Exo turns out to be a good herder, she's a, I think. She's a great herding dog. Uh, she has exotic <laughs> parentage, I think is the way to describe <laughs> it. Yeah. But, but yeah, so each, each of the herders would, would ordinarily have at least, usually it seems to me, three dog, three border collies. And then, you know, depending on how many wolves are, with, are about, they might have four to six guard dogs. Just we add dogs if we're in a dangerous place. Interesting, huh? So as a, a dog loving dog owner who likes to hike, um, and there may be others in, the, in our audience tonight too, um, as we come up a trail, I mean, my dog has to be on a leash all the time. That's just what she has to have. But some dogs are off leash. What would you recommend that dog owners do if we see a, a Great Pyrenees barking at us. I had that situation happen uh, um, up a drainage outside of Bellevue not long ago. What what should we do? If the if the dog is if the domestic dog is under voice control, call the dog back, mm -hmm. leash the dog, um, and speak pleasantly to the guard dog, but firmly. Yes. I mean, if you say no. Those dogs do know what no means. Um, they might still bark at you, so you might just decide to hold off going further. The, uh, the other thing is for those that are outdoor recreationists that uh, bike, uh, bicycles, mm -hmm. um, these guard dogs didn't evolve with bicycles and they don't know what to think about bikes. <laughs> um, and so if in doubt, it's it's a it's a bad thing, you know. It's it's going to harm. Dismount. Yeah, dismount and lay your bike down. Or walk with your or, bike. Or, or walk with your bike. You know, usually the dogs will come up and they'll challenge. And if they determine that you're not a threat, then they'll go okay, tail the wagon off. They go. They'll go back to um, their charges. Um, but uh, yeah, dismount for sure. And I recommend that. <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, listen for sheep sounds. You might hear that band because after all, there can be 2,000, 2,200 animals before you see those guard dogs. And if that's true, leash your dog. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, you know, the, the, those dogs, if you, if you speak to them, uh, you know, you'll probably be perfectly fine. I we've mean, yeah, we've, we've never, never had an we've incident. We've never had an incident where badly. someone was you know, injured uh, through a guard dog interaction with, uh, with any of our bands. Well, thank you for that. I know there are a lot of dog lovers in this, uh, in our community. Um, and I've really appreciated the collaboration between the BLM and the Forest Service and the, um, uh, the sheep companies uh, to post when sheep are in an area. 
um, that's very helpful because I would just as soon have happy guard dogs and happy sheep and maybe go walk someplace else. Right. Um, yeah, so because they're like Pedro was saying, they're just walking through an area um, for a short, relatively short period of time. So and um, they, we, we try to post signs like sheep in this area, trailheads, but BCRD, the rec district here, gets its information directly from the Forest Service from the Ketchum Ranger District because Pedro reports every week where our sheep are. And so if you go to the BCRD map, you'll see that <laughs> image of a lovely woolly sheep in this particular drainage. And so that way you know that if you've got uh, particularly a large dog that could be considered to be a greater threat by these livestock guardian dogs, mm -hmm. then maybe that's not the drainage you go hiking in that morning. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we don't, excuse me. Um, we don't have any specific questions or we were kind of wrapping up, um, Pedro talking about the yearly cycle and the daily cycle. Uh, we've kind of leaned into the sustainability and conservation part. Um, so um, there is a question about um, just asking about examples of non-lethal measures. So maybe you want to just go with the non-lethal measures or maybe you want to back up a little bit and talk about conservation easements and kind of a little bit more the bigger picture. What, what I, 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 I'd be happy to talk about non-lethal uh, fortunately, Kathleen is here and she has sharp pointed boots. So if I get rocks <laughs> and she picks the appropriate, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hear about it. Um, but basically, the non lethal deterrents are human presence and livestock guardian dogs. In that order, it's number one and two. And then there is equipment. And the equipment would be uh, lights and sounds and fladry or turbo fladry, which we don't use very much anymore. It's more difficult to deploy. But, that is. but it is fantastically effective. And the fladry is electrified fencing, you know, just single strand, you know, between fiberglass poles close to the ground, but the right number of inches above the ground and, and wolves uh, find it extremely unappealing. So they'll walk back and forth. Um, we try not to use the same non-lethal deterrents too many days in a row. We deploy these non-lethal deterrents when we're in the presence of wolves, when the herders have seen fresh scat, or they've heard howls, or they've seen wolves, or you know, uh, heaven forbid, you know, wolves got into the into the band, and there's already been a depredation incident, um, and then uh, we rotate them. So uh, we have different types of noisemakers, uh, like the air horns. We have different high intensity, high lumen lights. We have headlamps that we give to the herders. The band kits that we produce, um, and we give Avery Schaller great credit for this, but figuring out what to include in the bag of tricks, Felix's bag of tricks, um, uh, uh, has been an interesting exercise. And that needs to be transportable because a number of these bands will go into areas that they're packing into. So the sheep camp is left behind, right? And the herders living in a wall tent uh, up in the mountains, uh, including in the wilderness study areas uh, and other places that are non-motorized. So it's noisemakers, um, electrified fencing, um, the lights, guard dogs, human presence. And the guard dogs, um, the average number per band when we started 20 years ago was two of the big white dogs. And now it's four or five um, as the you know, threat has increased. And believe me, <clears throat> there are wolves all over um, the Wood River Valley in the National Forest. There are wolves in the Fairfield Ranger District. There are wolves east of us in the Pioneers and the Littlewood River and Muldoon and Friedman Creek drainages. And that first depredation was in Copper Creek and there've been wolves seen in the ranch. And we do lose guard dogs. Uh, we had one terrible period of 18 months where we lost three uh, from interaction with wolves. So um, these, these, these animals, we have enormous respect for them because they, they absolutely do their job. And sometimes with an uh, unfortunate outcome. So that's that on um, the non-lethal deterrence. Um, I think the Wood River Wolf Project website has pictures of some of this, some of these deterrents. 
uh, the materials or equipment that goes into a band kit. Um, but for all of that to be successful, it, it's the herder. The herder is, well, in many ways, the herder is number one. The herder is number one in terms of maintaining our sustainable practices. Um, uh, the herder is responsible for uh, very high value livestock. I mean, thousands of animals. Uh, the herder is responsible for grazing responsibly. Um, and once over and you know, only using a bed ground once and using different uh, water access points, not the same one. Um, and so the way the landscape looks at the end of the season on our allotments is uh, to a degree very much dependent on uh, herder commitment and buy-in. And uh, our guys do, uh, frankly, uh, they, do a, they do a wonderful job. Um, so uh, we're very pleased each year uh, to see um, the results on the ground, um, and which is a lovely segue, I think, Kristen, into sustainable practices. So um, for years and years and years and years, uh, we have tens of thousands of data points. We collar one or two animals per band, right? Uh, and these are recording GPS collars. And then that data goes into, sorry, nomenclature, but a shape file for our GIS system. And then we could map that and we can map it onto the allotments. And that's interesting because it shows if the herder went into a neighboring allotment, which is not you know, a which, good practice. And which they don't. <laughs> and they don't, right? Uh, but it would show that. And it shows if they use the same bed ground twice because they're recording the location every 15 minutes or 30 minutes. And we change the batteries in the middle of the season. And then you can see where they went. But one of the really interesting things, and I just use this as one example of what, what we've been thinking about. Um, these these uh, 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 dots on the map show where that band was. And the distance between those dots shows how fast they were moving. And the slower they go, the more they spread out perpendicular to the line of march. And the faster they go, they turn into like a spear point. So it's possible to actually, <clears throat> pardon me, map out where they were in an allotment. So instead of having, well, just pasture rotation, we actually know when was the last time we grazed that particular 100 acres. So it gives us an incredible degree of fine control in terms of understanding. And we also know um, what is in those allotments. So for those that aren't familiar with this, the public lands um, for BLM in the National Forest are defined where grazing is permitted. They're uh, units that are called allotments and they can be 15,000 acres or wild horse allotment is 240,000 acres. And they may have pastures which are typically unfenced or they may not have pastures and um, they support different vegetation types. You can imagine that if you're going from 4,000 feet to 10 or 11,000 feet, that the vegetation type in a 10 or 12 inch precipitation zone on the Snake River Plain is hugely different than 35 inches in a transitional forest from Doug fir to you know, subalpine fir and whatnot in the high pioneers. And so we have um, north of Highway 20, we've mapped out what those veg vegetation types are and we ascribe to them a certain biomass production per year, like pounds per acre, right? And what we do um, is we say, well, <clears throat> if it's less than 200 pounds per acre, we don't graze it. If it's, less, if it's greater than two and a half miles from water for sheep, or a mile uh, uh, from water for cattle, then we don't graze it. If it has a slope gradient that's greater than X percent, like 25% or 30%, then we don't graze it with cattle. But with sheep, that slope gradient can go to 40% because they're smaller, there's less impact, less physical impact, right? Less PSI per hoof, right? And then we'll go, well, if it's a thousand pounds, just to use that as an example, we'll go, all right, um, how much of that is non-edible, non-comestible? Well, you know, tree growth rings, okay? So maybe you're down to 800 pounds, right? And then that 800 pounds, we're gonna set aside 
a certain amount for our wild ungulate friends like the elk and the deer, the pronghorn, right? And then we look at what condition is that range, that particular area, that particular allotment in. So maybe we set aside more for just carbon sequestration and soil improvement, and then we take maybe 50% of what's left of the number, not 50% of what's growing, but 50% of that reduced number in terms of pounds, and then that's the max. And since we know how many pounds a sheep, being a ewe, eats per day, depending upon where she is in gestation and where she is in lactation, and it may range from six or seven pounds to 12 pounds of wet forage biomass per day. And if we know how many sheep are in the band, then we can calculate how long they can stay and no longer to consume no more than what we've calculated is appropriate to harvest in that place. Wow. So what challenges did you face um, this spring with the extreme huh. drought that we're in? I mean, it's, I mean, it's, everything's parched out there. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, I'll tell you, um, since we're not running 9,000 ewes, I, we have a lot more flexibility on effectively the same size footprint than we did, you know, 18, 19 years ago. This was an extraordinary year. Uh, uh, Pedro has 32 years of experience in landscape. I've seen 20 of these seasons. And this was the driest. Um, and so it was challenging this year, even for us, to find green feed. Um, and we shipped later um, because we put uh, some of our sheep and lambs on our, on our uh, alfalfa uh, and polyculture aftermath at the main ranch. But amazingly, I'm delighted to say that whereas, you know, typically we might see 125 115, 120 pounds per, you know, animal live weight getting onto the trucks. We had one truck that was over 150 pounds. So, uh, you know, it's a miracle. I can't, I can't explain that, but the guys did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. But this year was very challenging and we had to modify. I mean, these, these are not, I mean, yes, quite a bit of deed of land out there, but this landscape that we're privileged to graze on that we have grazing preference is largely public land right and so you know those agencies have a perspective on what they want to see right and we have a perspective that we want to deliver that we want to make sure that they're happy with what we're doing on you know land that's effectively managed in trust for the citizens of the united states right and this year was this this was this was a tough year um, uh, that way. And we are seeing, uh, particularly over the last eight or nine years, a lot more variability. So the, the precipitation differences, you know, taking a look at that huge winter of 2016, 17 with the flooding. And then this year, this 1920 winter that wasn't a winter um, is creating greater challenge because it represents a risk over which we have essentially no control, mm -hmm. right? And these are living creatures and they need to be managed in a way that's appropriate for them. You know, Brian, this might be a good segue. Um, uh, I know you've done some restoration work on creeks um, and that's, a, that's really important. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about why they needed restoration and the sorts of things that um, uh, were done to uh, restore them. I think I'm going to hand that, Kristen, if I could, to Kathleen. Yeah, jump right in. Um, but one thing I, I want to just back up enough to say that when we started on this whole adventure, we were um, in very working super closely with the Nature Conservancy. Um, and I had worked for the Conservancy in California, so we were um, we knew them well. And they helped us create a really comprehensive conservation plan and then to implement a lot of studies. So we really, we really owe them a great um, vote of thanks and, um, and had a great uh, group of scientists who were advising us on how to 
figure out how to do this grazing, how to, how to imagine how much biomass was in an acre or whatever. Um, so it kind of started with that, but part of it was we were looking at the landscape and saying, well, where does it, where could it use a little bit of help? And there were, you know, over the course of the however many hundred years of grazing that's gone on in this, in this country, um, some things, you know, have been eroded, you know, some places have been used a little heavily just over the decades. And so there were a few places that we wanted to, um, give some attention to and be a little more proactive than just some, some places, you know, places will be uh, very often will be restored themselves. If you leave them be, that may take some time, but in some cases we've actually did projects where we put in bio, what they call bio logs that are, you know, things that they slow down the water so that you can address the erosion issues. And one summer, there was one Creek that we restored that way with the help of TNC and my girls and I, when the girls were like, I don't know, five and 10 or something, would drive out to this remote part of the ranch and then go down to the creek and fill up buckets and dump them on the willows that were planted. <laughs> I'm very happy that we uh, were able to do that and that it was worthwhile. Um, and at the main ranch, there is a, a long stretch of Copper Creek that flows right through Love Lake, Maine, that was um, basically eliminated for many years because uh, for for the sake of efficiency in farming it was it was just kind of plowed under and turned into alfalfa and there we actually with some cost share money and help from government agencies um, looked at the old aerial photographs figured out where the creek really should run and brought in a lot of earth moving equipment to put that creek pattern back and then plant alongside it and We've seen, we've done bird surveys at the ranch from the very beginning. Um, Jay Carlisle at Boise State is just one of our favorite people on the planet and we've been privileged to go out and- A great it. birder actually, a great birder. I, I'll just say this because it's so much fun. We, we got to go out with him, Brian and me and the girls maybe about four years ago um, at dawn and we went to all of his GPS points up Copper Creek and what happens when you go do this with Jay is you get to his GPS point and then everybody stops talking for one minute. Or else. Well, <laughs> or else. Of course, yes. who wants to talk? And right. for one minute, he has got his notepad and, and he's going like this and he's just listening. And he, he'll come up with 20 species of birds and he can tell you if it's a one-year-old female or a male or whatever. So anyway, um, all that to say, we are very interested in measuring the impact of what we do. Um, and we have seen a big shift in terms of the number of riparian uh, bird species on the ranch, which makes us very happy. So um, that's the whole, our whole goal was to, to do good conservation work and to be honest about it, like to actually measure it, to do photo monitoring and vegetation surveys and, and to say, we can, we can see that this is working or that this isn't working and how do we adjust? So that's been something that's been a lot of fun. And we've had um, researchers out from Boise State and other places um, doing their own research on the ranch. And that's been great fun to just to be able to give them a place to do um, their research. So I've heard of the Pioneer Alliance, but I don't know what that is. The Pioneer Alliance? Well, the, you know, um, we, we, we'd begun a process of permanent conservation on our, on our deeded lands. We can come back to that. Um, and and I, I was having, um, you know, thoughts that, well, maybe this larger landscape uh, can be conserved if we can all kind of pull together on it. Uh, and so Mike Stevens, who deserves a shout out and runs the Nature Conservancy's Washington State program now, uh, was the president of Lava Lake for 11 years. And um, uh, we talked to our Science and Conservation Board and uh, some, you know, pretty serious talks with, with Mike. And we got a Hewlett Foundation grant for a quarter million dollars, um, which was effectively partitioned and funneled to two or three environmental uh, NGOs here, uh, where it created focus on this landscape 
Um, and we did that in cooperation with NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is an agency within USDA. Um, and so we went from uh, the first easement that we had donated on Love Lake Main Ranch in Cottonwood in 2001, and there was just this, this period, uh, period where nothing was happening. And then we um, were able to catalyze uh, uh, a lot of money coming into the landscape to provide conservation easements with our colleagues, neighbors and friends, uh, mostly in the Cary community and have conserved over 100,000 acres of deeded land as a consequence. And the Pioneers Alliance, Kristen, was the vehicle that was the local collaborative entity that involved those environmental entities and NRCS, the agencies, and most particularly community leadership and ranchers that had an interest, an abiding interest, a very strong interest in maintaining um, uh, ranching there, uh, maintaining that lifestyle as they could see land conversion happening around them and they didn't want it. And so there was a period of about three years where permanent conservation in the Pioneers Alliance um, area of influence was proceeding at two to 3,000 acres of permanent conservation per month. Wow, excellent. Um, I know we're running out of time. There's so many things I would like to ask. Um, I want to circle back with a question to Pedro, but could one, either you, Kathleen, or, or maybe Pedro has this answer, I don't know. Um, I was astonished, um, it must be 10 years ago, to learn about the large migration path of, of pronghorn um, based on a study that you folks did. It, there were several articles in the paper. I mean, we all see pronghorn, but um, we don't think of them as especially gathering up in the fall and migrating to a whole other area. And that was based on research from your institute, wasn't it? Isn't that where that information came out? We were part of that study and we helped, we, we provided some of the funding for it um, and uh, TNC was involved and I don't remember, uh, yeah, IDFG, I think. IDFG, BLM, uh, Lighthawk, there, there are actually 11 collaborators Mm. Um, and nobody knew where these pronghorn went, and it was one of those really cool things that you get to do once in your life, maybe. Mm -hmm. Let's let's find out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Helicopter netting, and you know, in fact, in fact, uh, one of our neighbors um, uh, was assisting with that, and he jumped out of a helicopter and broke his leg doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't try this. Yeah, don't do this at home, kids. The um, thing that was great that came out of that study was that it was recognized that pronghorn don't deal well with fences, mm -hmm. and so we worked really hard to help educate local landowners about getting rid of the bottom strand of barbed wire so that they could get under it. And um, spent a lot of time out in the field and helping people make changes to their fencing, which people, I mean, everybody loves pronghorns. So it's, it's a, it's not a hard sell to get people to do that actually. Pronghorn are the fastest land animal in North America. And apparently they evolved with cheetahs back when cheetahs were in North America. And so they can run 45 to 50 miles an hour. And if you, I mean, their eyes are enormous in their skulls. So they are very alert to predators and their main defense is speed. And so I can see why fences would be a huge problem for them if they're running flat out. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Craters of the Moon National Monument um, has taken out a total now of eight miles of fences mm -hmm. uh, because that migration route goes right through that portion of the monument that's north of the highway there. Um, yeah, the um, folks, uh, Berger and his uh, collaborators did this really wonderful work in Jackson Hole and looking at um, multiple migration routes out of Jackson. Um, and uh, that and this are the longest uh, terrestrial um, mammal 
migrations in North America, with the exception of the barren ground caribou, which oh. you know, is like oh. a 1,200 miles, something ridiculous. So yeah. and the, the very cool thing about that, and we'll you know, we can, uh, end this topic there, is that for two years, we helicopter netted here in Blaine County, in the Little Wood, in Fish Creek, and other places. But the third year, since we at that point knew where they went, we netted in November, in the winter, after they'd arrived at their destination, uh, over on the east side of INL, you know, a uh, long ways away. And we have animations uh, uh, based on, you know, the radio caller data that show animals from that group going over Bannock Pass into Montana, going over uh, uh, Bannock Pass, right? And uh, 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 moving, you know, basically across the Continental Divide. And so that was interesting from a research perspective because pronghorn, there are not nearly as many pronghorn, of course, as there were. And so population genetics and genetic health, population genetic health, showed that these animals are migrating far enough that they can interchange um, uh, uh, genes with populations coming down from the north in Montana. So there are a lot of implications of that work that we had no idea uh, would result from it. Mm -hmm. But it was really a lot of, a lot of great outfits. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty proud of that study. It was neat. Yeah, every fall I see little clusters of, of pronghorn and, and because of your study, I think, I know where you guys are going. You're going over by Birch Creek and you're going further north and it's just, uh, it's, I don't know, it just, it just makes it feel more intimate, you know, um, yeah. it's just wonderful. But I know we're getting so close to the end here and like I said, there, I, there are several more questions, but I wanted to circle back to Pedro. Um, Pedro, we have a couple of questions. Um, one question is, has to do with mentoring. Um, how do you mentor or how do you teach the incoming sheep herders the right way, how to see the grass and know when to move or when to stay? So that's one question and kind of tied along with it is how do you protect the the ewes and lambs when you're out in the wild like that from coyotes, which sound like they're the worst predator of all. Um, could you talk to us just a little bit about that? Yeah, we, when we hire a new sheep herder, most of them are from Peru, mm -hmm. the, the, the relatives are here and, and they ask for, they say, I know these people, I know where they, they are from, and um, and we hire those people. At the start, we sometimes we used to try and with a with a older sheeper, like on the, on on the desert. We 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 never give it like a, a use and lambs, a band use and lambs. Just keep the use. We call use them some as a dries, and they hear the sheep for six months, seven months, and then we. When we go to the mountains, we mix those sheep and put with another older sheeper and the captain that takes care and myself teach him or direct him what to do, uh, which place to go, mm -hmm. or things like that. Uh, it's not very difficult to teach a new sheeper because they know from even from Peru, you know. From so Peru. They, okay. Yeah, they, well, they they know about sheep before they. Yeah, do. most of the sheeper they know. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then to keep the coyotes out, we have those guard dogs. Mm -hmm. They they patrol or they they stay aware of the coyotes. That's uh, since we have guard dogs, like Brian said, or Catherine said, four or five. We very lost ewes or, or lambs on the okay. desert. Uh -huh. The mountains were difficult for guard dogs, but in the desert. We, they take care pretty good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Great. Well, we've really kind of come to the end of our 
time here. Um, there are several more questions I'd like to ask, but um, I, I'm just going to um, have to have you guys come back, I guess. Uh, this was a wonderful talk. Um, thank you so much, Pedro, for thank you. Um, sharing a little bit about your life and um, just the, the um, responsibilities that you have uh, for the ranch and for um, the sheep and for the sheep herders and the animals that you care for, the dogs and, and uh, horses. Um, and Kathleen and Brian, thank you so much for your care and um, compassion for your place, the place, the land, um, and um, your attentiveness in managing it um, um, for posterity. Really, it's uh, much appreciated, actually. Um, thank, thank you. you. It's been really fun to have this conversation. So thank you, Kristen. And a final shout out to the many partners, federal and state agencies and conservation uh, groups, conservation and groups, universities, yeah. na neighbors. We have neighbors. great neighbors and we really rely on our neighbors here. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a small community of wonderful people. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, maybe we could end. Um, Maybe you could tell us uh, where people could find your lamb, but also, Brian, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, you uh, shared a quote from Kathleen who spoke the other day that I was um, really quite moved about in terms of your sense of responsibility um, towards the animals that are under your care. Well, you know, we, 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 we talked this, this evening about some fairly technical things and some, you know, ancient things. Um, and I remember <clears throat> that Kathleen was once asked, well, what kind of a life are you giving these animals? I mean, these are meat animals. And her thoughtful response um, was, our desire is to provide those lambs with a life that is as close to the life that they would have had before sheep were domesticated 10,000 years ago. Amazing uh, gui guiding principle. Um, so where can people um, get, get your lamb? Um, well, it's, uh, you know, this, this year with the disruptions of the pandemic, that was really felt in, in meat production, um, in processing. And uh, so it's getting, a, it's getting a little leaner for a short time, gang. But uh, we do still have our lamb on um, some of the restaurants in the, you know, restaurants have been hit so hard too. But we're still in restaurants here in the Wood River Valley. We have been for over 15 years, including just some of the most loyal, wonderful customers. Um, the best place to get our lamb right now is through Cray's Market Garden. And Cray's will deliver to your door once a week. And um, we're, we're really loving working with Craze and supporting their business and it's really efficient for us and we're kind of going super local right now so um, that's the best way we still do have our website and we are um, shipping lamb all over the country through the website uh, but I think we're going to shift our balance to more and more local as we go forward. Great thank you um, and uh, just a reminder to everyone that I will be sending out a thank you email uh, with a link to their website and also a link uh, to this video if you weren't able to watch the whole thing or wanted to watch a certain part of it. Um, and also uh, take a look on the website because there are some really tasty lamb recipes on it. Uh, so you can expand your uh, culinary skills. Um, so. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kathleen and Brian. And thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, for taking the time and, and sharing um, in this conversation with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, everyone.